questions, um, and one that uh, presents some opportunities for some pretty cost-effective emissions reductions. Um, so we're proposing, uh, again, a 40% reduction in, in emissions from this source. Um, and we want to get at that uh, through financial incentives, through um, specific bans and regulations on, on limits on, uh, app, on use of HFCs uh, with certain global warming potential values in sectors and applications where there's uh, lower impact gases available or alternatives available. Um, and an HFC phase down, uh, global phase down like we've done for the other F gases under the Montreal Protocol. Uh, is widely seen as, as the most effective way to do this uh, globally and address the problem. There's a lot of momentum to reach an agreement this year. We hope that happens. Uh, if that doesn't happen, we'll consider our own phase down in California. Europe's doing it, Canada, Australia, Japan, others are looking at it. Uh, so that's something we'll look at if, if there isn't a global agreement this year. Um, this plan, uh, as I mentioned, has a new economic analysis, which uh, includes the direct costs uh, and direct economic benefits associated with efficiency savings or potential revenues from various approaches uh, to reduce methane emissions at dairies or, or waste, uh, as well as HFCs um, and the other measures in this plan, uh, uh, the, the wood stove conversion as well. Uh, it doesn't include societal benefits or costs, uh, just the revenue from a project and the costs from a project development. Um, what it found, especially on the organics piece, as I mentioned that dairy piece and the landfill piece are waste streams that we would like to capture value from. Uh, there's potential value from there, potential significant value there to the dairy industry and other project developers, especially if you can capture low carbon fuel standard and, and RIN credits under the federal renewable fuel standard. Those are obviously uncertain. Uh, the markets for those are, are uncertain and you have to be able to get the gas from your project into the pipeline or into a truck. Um, but we think that's an exciting opportunity and we want to uh, work with uh, researchers and stakeholders in the industry further to try to figure out how we, how we can make that happen because we think there's some good benefit there economically, environmentally as well. Um, other uh, strategies that don't potent produce potential revenues, uh, you know, or look more costly and, and deserve continued support, I think, from the state. Um, but again, this is something we certainly welcome your comments and input on uh, and something we want to continue to look at and refine moving forward. Um, we did a uh, draft environmental analysis. Um, and determined that the proposed actions and the uh, proposed strategy may have potentially significant impacts to some areas. However, these impacts are mainly due to short-term uh, construction-related activities. The staff is committed to working with other state and local agencies to ensure that any steps taken pursuant to the proposed strategy avoid environmental trade-offs and maximize potential environmental benefits where feasible. The draft environmental analysis was released for a 45-day comment period, which started on April 11th, 2016, and will end on May 26th, 2016. Staff will prepare written responses to all the relevant draft environmental analysis comments received. Um, so next steps were uh, we will present this strategy to the board um, on May 19th. Uh, the comment period ends on May 26th. And in late summer or early fall, we will present the final strategy with comments to the environmental analysis uh, to the board for approval. Um, contact information for uh, many of us there. Please feel free to reach out to any of us with specific comments or questions. Uh, you can go to our website as well where you can uh, comment on this strategy, and we certainly hope that you will do so. Uh, and you can find other uh, information as well. Um, with that, I want to uh, let Jenny Lester Moffitt with the um, uh, Department of Food and Ag give a couple comments, and then we'll hand it over to our Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Yeah. Um, hi, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, thank you guys for being here. I um, appreciate the large crowd given the drive it's always um, it makes it worthwhile to have many people here and to provide com public comments so I just want to thank everyone for being here um, as Ryan mentioned the Department of Food and Ag has been very involved with the Air Resources Board 
in the development of this draft strategy. Um, as Ryan did also mention, it's a very aggressive strategy. Methane is, um, from dairies especially, um, is a short-lived climate pollutant and one that we are working statewide to address, and it's a very important um, emission that we are working on. Um, and so um, certainly there are, as Ryan did, I think, a really great job describing some of the barriers and some of the things as far as low-carbon fuel standards that we're working on. We also at the Department of Food and Ag have a um, dairy digester research and development program. We received $12 million last year in the green, through the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund program um, and funded five digesters, most of them down here in the Bakersfield and, and throughout the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and so there are opportunities in the state um, to really be able to tap into some statewide funding. Um, there are also opportunities for federal funding as well. So I think the more that we can look at some of those creative solutions to achieve these goals, um, I think, are, um, are definitely wins for all of us around. Um, again, I want to thank you for being here, and I look forward to hearing all of your comments. And um, that's all I'll say for now. Thanks. So, um, can we invite Tom and, and Ray up to, uh, do you want to speak, you can sit here or stand, take as you prefer. Thank you for joining us. You can sit at the table if you want. I'm fine here. Sure. I stand here a lot in this room. <laughs> but uh, my name is Tom Franz and I am on the Environmental Justice Advisory Group our committee for AB 32 and I've been in that position since maybe 2008 something like that and uh, we the people on this committee represent the environmental justice communities in this case Ray Leon and myself the communities here in the San Joaquin Valley in other words we represent the people who breathe the air and perhaps suffer environmental con consequences of things like climate change and, of course, the toxics and, and other air pollutants that we have in our air. And the Ameri American Lung Association just noted that Bakersfield has the worst air in the nation. We've had that, that title before. That's for the years 2012 through 2014. That's how they average, or they take a three-year average, and that's their latest average when Bakersfield ranked the worst in the nation, especially for a fine particulate matter. So there's a lot of stuff with the, uh, related to fine particulate matter when you talk about black carbon and when you talk about uh, even uh, methane reductions perhaps, certainly VOC reductions and other air pollutants. One thing about AB 32 is it specifies that CARB do no harm in making their plan to reduce greenhouse gases in regard to air pollution. In fact, the law pretty specifically states that CARB has to look for co-benefits that will hopefully come from reducing greenhouse gases, co-benefits uh, of air pollution reduction. So one of our concerns, of course, you talk about black carbon from uh, fireplaces, and we're concerned that uh, Everyone's looking for a way that we can continue to burn wood in a place like the valley here, maybe a bit more cleaner, and subsidizing all that. And we're quite concerned about that, that uh, it's not really the way to solve the problem. We have to stop burning for fuel for several reasons in this valley, for, for the fine particulates that we're breathing all the time. To, to continue burning any fuel doesn't make a lot of sense if there's alternatives. And... Uh, so subsidizing clean fireplaces is a concern we have. Um, and I don't know what the plans are going forward on that, but uh, it's an environmental justice concern, and it has been for many years. The, uh, you know, talking about hauling biomass out of the forest, and we're already hauling biomass from L.A. into this valley. And of course we have our own, I'm an almond farmer, and we have our own biomass issues here in the valley with almond wood stuff like that. Um, but burning it, that's, that's ancient history, I think, burning biomass for energy. 
it, it's called renewable energy and it's called something that doesn't add to the greenhouse gases in the a atmosphere. But it's an extremely dirty, inefficient way to get energy. And it pollutes our air with fine particulates. Our biomass incinerators are huge polluters here in Kern County. I know one of them recently closed, but uh, it's still going on. And uh, so to talk about hauling biomass out of the forest to burn it for, for so-called clean energy because of the greenhouse gas reductions you may or may not be getting is uh, a concern. Um, as far as in, in oil and gas, you know, they're a big polluter here in Kern County. There's no question about that in terms of VOCs and the energy, the natural gas that's burned to make energy for steam and, of course, electricity for that industry. Uh, we agree there shouldn't be methane leaking into the, our air from the oil and gas industry. You know, that's got to be cut back, of course. But uh, we hope there's not an increase in flaring which would add to our air pollution and things like that. Um, the, um, the dairy digesters, for similar reasons, are problematic, perhaps, uh, because we're talking about making a fuel that will be burned here in the valley. To uh, Maybe it'll be burned a little cleaner than diesel, that's true, but there should be ways not to make that methane in the first place and to return all of the energy in cow manure back to the soil, which is really the traditional way to farm. And uh, not to always think about how can we make money doing this. And, and we're, we're, we're trying to reduce uh, air pollution and greenhouse gases at the same time. So we should always be looking for ways to do both. And the best way to reduce greenhouse gases, in my opinion, as a farmer, is to take carbon out of the air and keep some of it back in the soil. Always return as much as possible to the soil. And I know that's expensive to do. It involves composting and stuff like that. And removing manure before it, it uh, starts to degrade so that you still have all these nutrients. Any dairy farmer knows he can grow a crop with dairy manure but he's got too much of it. But there's farmers all around that can use that manure. So to just talk about turning it into a fuel without talking about what you're going to do with the uh, coal pollutant, all the ammonia that's in there, what's going to happen to all that ammonia? If you're not mandating reductions in ammonia that's just being wasted in our air at the same time, uh, you're not taking a big enough view of this uh, methane reduction. So. Uh, I think there's some false accounting going on too, that when you burn something and call it renewable energy, you're not adding to our greenhouse gas burden. You're certainly adding to it in the short, short run when talking about forest products and so on. Uh, you know, the last thing we need right now is adding a lot of CO2 to, to our air from burning fuels. It, uh, I think environmental justice people who are concerned about getting co-benefits and so on, see burning as a real negative, burning any fuel or energy at this point. Electricity is the way to go. Uh, my farm, I've reduced my fossil fuel use by at least 80 percent, mainly by pumping all my water with solar panels and driving electric vehicles for 90 percent of my transportation needs, all using solar panels. That technology is so easy, but you know that, that should be incentivized for farmers. Yet. If you start making uh, methane from digesters, we might start going backwards. Instead of moving towards electric motors for everything, including transportation, using solar energy to, to uh, power those motors, then, uh, you know, we're, instead of doing that, we're promoting internal combustion engines, basically. That's, that's a step backwards, I think. So I'll stop now. We'll make a lot more comments. Uh, as, as this process goes on. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, one thing I just like to uh, thank you for your comments. And one thing I, um, you know, I mentioned our Dairy Digester Research and Development Program, but I failed to mention some of our other programs that we have at the Department of Food and Ag. I think there are, you're absolutely right that there are a lot of opportunities to really be creative um, and, and digesters, you know, um, 
I float the idea of the, the manure menu, um, which may not be so palatable for a lot of people. <laughs> but, um, but there are, and I think we need to be comprehensive in how we look at, at all strategies for reducing methane emissions from dairies. One of the programs that CDFA has been involved in is the Healthy Soils Initiative, and it is looking at finding opportunities to, um, to compost not just dairy manure, but other items as well, food waste. Um, the, you know, recycle, you know, organic material from cities and stuff like that and be able to really look at opportunities for incorporating those into the agricultural arena. Um, and so, and then also other soil management practices, a lot of NRCS conservation practices that are tried and true for many years through USDA um, and really like take a comprehensive approach at soil management as well. Um, but it does have many benefits in the dairy arena as far as um, opportunities and outlets for, for that compost that could be produced through the dairy. So thank you for your comments. But I just wanted to add to, to that and talk a little bit more about some of our climate programs that we have. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ray Leon. I'm uh, originally from, well, born in Fresno, raised in the Huron community. This is my first time here, so I feel I got to introduce myself. Uh, of course, I've been in Bakersfield numerous times. Uh, my sister's been living here for a couple of decades now. But um, can I think we need to turn it on. Which was, well, this is a light, I think. Okay, there it is. Hey, thank you. Who's the DJ? But. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and it's definitely a pleasure uh, participating in the, on the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee for the California Resources Board. I, my father is a Bracero farm worker. My family is, are a lot of farm workers still, and uh, that's why I'm on the EJAG, because of, I think, uh, my intimate knowledge and uh, uh, proximity to farm worker families who are part of my committees in different communities in uh, Fresno and Kings County. And, uh, and we see what's going on on a daily basis, you know. Uh, I started my work a long time ago as a student organizing, started the health fair in my hometown of Huron. So health is definitely what's important. And every time I hear about economic analysis, I'm always wondering, okay, so uh, when are we going to do the public health analysis? You know, what are the benefits to the community in terms of these changes? You know, I think there should be some metrics provided uh, uh, to also give us that understanding because I know that when uh, the air is cleaner, there is less asthma attacks. When there is less asthma attacks, there's more kids in school. You know, there's people going to work. You know, uh, those are also economic items that, that we should take into account in the public health analysis. Uh, for years now, I've been doing this air quality uh, advocacy at the Air District, and, uh, and they have an economic analysis as well pertaining to the impact on businesses and corporations, but never really is it on people. You know, we really got to try to figure that one out uh, because at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're talking about. And, uh, and there's ways of innovation that we can move forward to be able to benefit both, you know, business and, and, and community. But um, so, you know, just I think, I think uh, Professor uh, Tom France really broke it down just now. <laughs> you know, in terms of, uh, I mean, basically speaking to staying close to natural systems, right? Uh, incineration we know is not good. Uh, it's something that is under the umbrella of renewable, uh, the renewable portfolio standard, you know, painting it as if it's clean, but we know that it's actually worse than natural gas power plants when, you know, an incinerator, uh, a biomass incinerator that creates or generates energy. We're, we're, we're crazy about generating energy, which is definitely important, but we got to do it in a way that's not going to impact uh, the health of families. And Valley Leap, my organization, I, I forgot to mention, Latino Environmental Advancement and Policy Project, we've participated in uh, fighting off new power plants. That because uh, power plant closed down in the central coast, you know, where the air is clean, even with the power plant because of the winds and what have you, you know, of course, if you live next door to the muffler or you're by the, mu right next door to the muffler, you're going to get a, a bad hit of, of some, uh, some, uh, some pollution. But you know, they close one down over there, all of a sudden they want to build one up between some of the 
two, three poorest communities in the state because, you know, you could use ERCs, uh, emission reduction credits. I call them uh, emission remove and, and uh, re emissions relocating, you know, credits, uh, which are, are, are really negative in many cases because at the end of the day, while they uh, uh, reduce e emissions, and I think this has some something to do with uh, with um, uh, with the whole cap and trade, you know, and and it, it's kind of I think for the environmental justice community, it's kind of like all right, so uh, we're going to give credits, and where are they going to place them? Uh, usually, uh, what we've seen is that environmental justice communities are the recipients of the pollutants that the credits are paying for, you know, which has been the case regionally, and the fight that we've been a part of to try to uh, uh, keep that from happening. Uh, uh, both uh, the ones that we participated participated in, uh, in in fending off uh, have been uh, the Avenal power plant and the Parlier power plant, which literally they want to put them next door to communities that are you know farm worker communities. And those of you that know uh, farm worker communities uh, more so than the general you know low income public is has less access to health care, you know, which is just another weight on the downward spiral in terms of a healthy community. And so, and I know that because I see it, you know, uh, uh, family members, I got family members that are also uh, truck drivers, so I have a unique perspective on that as well, and, uh, and so forth. But um, the natural systems, I mean, you know, if we haul it off from one field or from one spot to another, we use it with technologies that are still very dirty. And I'm talking about diesel, PM 2.5, you know, the, 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 the main suspect uh, that, that uh, is attributable to over, I think, 2,000 premature deaths per year in the valley still. Right, we have the 99 and the five. Uh, it's, it's it's a lot of a lot of uh, mobile pollution, and in the pies, I mean, you could see it there. It's uh, reflecting how 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 grand it is, and how impactful. Uh, the San Joaquin Valley continues to be the dumping ground for other parts of the state. Uh, uh, there's a landfill in one of the communities I work with uh, in the city of Avenel, where they get like 20 tons of or uh, 200 tons of garbage uh, per day. And they don't bring it in on an electric, you know, heavy duty truck. They're bringing it, bringing, they're bringing it in in a diesel, you know, truck. And that's a lot of trucks. I mean, 200 tons, think about it, that's a, that's a lot of diesel trucks. So, and one of the issues that we've been dealing with is that due to the landfills, uh, uh, I think deficient practice, emissions have been released and uh, community members are getting sick. And so there's no reason why, because they're low income, because they're farm workers, they have to live in these circumstances. Definitely not. That shouldn't be allowed. And there should be a voice at the state level, and I think in every agency, to ensure that that doesn't happen. And um, just my last point. Oh, well, I want to say in terms of the goal for with Cal Recycle for landfills, definitely. You know, we're in the process of doing a, a campaign. We got a community garden to try to, we, 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 we compost our stuff for the garden, but try to, you know, figure out, you know, with other folks to make some of that happen. And I think that's a good goal. I think that's a, that's, a, that's a very positive thing. And I'd like to, you know, learn more about it. Uh, definitely electrify all the water pumps. I still see water pumps that are right next door to electrical lines. And then there's a big old, uh, 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 what is it, um, tambo. I'll say it in Spanish. Let's see. Who could translate that? Uh, we're failing here, man. We're failing here. Uh, un tambo, like a, a drum, a 50-gallon drum, full of oil, because I guess they use it, and then there's big oil all over the ground. You know, uh, it's just electrify, especially those that are next to the electrical line. And about two miles away, there's like 10 megawatts of, uh, of a solar field, you know, <laughs> generating electric, you know, clean electricity. So, I mean, there's a lot of dots that are easily connected that we just got to, you know, uh, take care of. But uh, it's my pleasure to, to be a part of the EJAC and to represent my families, my communities. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I appreciate your comments on the health analysis, and, and that's one thing I neglected to say. We do have a, a health section in there. It's not nearly as quantitative. It's not quantitative, I should say, uh, we work on compared that. to the economics. Item on the next eject meeting. Thank you. Uh, and certainly, I, I'd, I'd love to offer uh, and solicit comments uh, and, and references that we can cite and uh, specific numbers to help try to improve uh, some quantification of the health benefits uh, and impacts of these. Uh, one of the ch challenges and difficulties is, you know, as, as Jenny mentioned, we have a, a manure, or pardon me, a menu of options uh, in these sectors. And so, you know, we can, we can look at it, but it's difficult to pinpoint, but, but thank you. And I do just want to emphasize uh, our desire to look at all these sectors holistically uh, and, and across goals um, to make sure that what we're doing uh, supports air quality and, and climate goals. Um, and we, we tried to do that uh, as we laid out the economic analysis here and talking about some of the ways that you could approach these reductions. Uh, and certainly to the extent as we develop these measures more specifically through separate processes, we would go through a whole detailed uh, public health and, and environmental and economic analysis as well. Um, with that, I'm going to open it up to the group in just a minute, but uh, I regret that at our last workshop I neglected to uh, um, read one comment that we received, uh, so I'd just like to do that now um, and address uh, comments from Chuck White that we received at our last workshop. Um, he had four questions here. Uh, the first was, um, I'm going to see if I can paraphrase on the fly here. Um, the first was uh, a discussion that um, landfills are already big anaerobic digesters and much of the gas is being collected and, and used to produce low carbon energy or fuel. Uh, the gas that is not collected um, is uh, destroyed or not emitted. Clearly there's benefits associated with these efforts, he says. Why is ARB apparently dismissing the benefits uh, from these systems? I'll just read through his comments and then try to address them at the end. The second um, is uh, why doesn't ARB utilize state-of-art models to evaluate resident residual fugitive methane emissions from landfills? And he specifically uh, cites the California Energy Commission, which has supported the development of the CalMIN model to better estimate emissions. Why doesn't ARB further evaluate landfill emissions using CalMIN? Uh, his third comment is um, the strategy assumes that much of the landfill methane comes from delayed installation of a gas collection system that uh, results in zero or low collection rates during the first few years of waste placement. Why doesn't ARB take a closer look at this uh, and see if uh, methane can be more effectively collected and used or beneficially used beneficially or destroyed at landfills from day one of waste placement. And then his final question um, is uh, the solid waste industry is currently engaged in an effort to redirect organics, pardon me, to uh, divert 75% of organic waste from landfills by 2020 in accordance with existing law and policy. Um, why doesn't ARB look at the efficacy of these efforts uh, and delay proposed controls until they can be fully evaluated? So I just want to comment uh, on a couple of these. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty uh, with measuring uh, methane emissions, understanding where they come from, especially at these big area sources and biological systems that are landfills especially, but also dairies and cows. Um, we do our best to model them. We rely on, on models from uh, US EPA and others. Uh, we are looking at the research, working with CalRecycle, uh, especially on the landfill piece, but all the agencies to try to make sure we're aware of the research, supporting research, and we want to continue to do so to improve our understanding of methane emissions at landfills in California. Uh, we're using the best science that's available today, uh, at least in our, our minds, and. Uh, working again with CalRecycle to make sure that we're all uh, comfortable with, with what we're doing and we will continue to work with CalRecycle and are committed to try to further refine our understanding of emissions from landfills uh, in the future. What we do know is that um, uh, landfills generate methane and will continue to generate methane as long as organics are, are being placed in landfills and we think there's beneficial alternative uses for those organics through compost or through energy production. So. 
um, you know, we want to continue to pursue those efforts, and we think that the, that the proposals and uh, the proposed measures in this proposed strategy uh, are in line with and build off of current uh, state policy and goals. Um, so thank you, Chuck, for that, uh, those comments, and I apologize that I didn't uh, get to them at the last workshop. Hopefully anybody on the Internet uh, who provides comments, we will get them today, and I will uh, uh, read them and, and address them. Uh, so with that, uh, we want to open up the mic. Um, please, if you're inclined, uh, state your name and your affiliation. Uh, we are recording this. It will be posted on our website. Uh, and any comments received, we will, uh, related to environmental analyses especially, we will uh, be re responding to as well. So, so do folks have to go to the mic because we do have mics? Yes, yes I believe so. Please come, the come to the mic. Um, thank you. Hello, Tom Umanoff for Western States Petroleum Association. Uh, I have some questions and, uh, and perhaps a couple of comments after I run through the, the questions. Not many. Uh, you mentioned a 20-year uh, GWP. What is that number you are using? Because there are multiple numbers that are used. Is it? So for methane, uh, I assume is, you know, that's the one that people are most familiar with. We're using the fourth assessment. 20-year uh, GWP value, which is 72. Correct. The 100-year number, which is used in our inventory, is also from the fourth assessment, is 25. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Um, on your uh, slide uh, number number seven, you uh, noted for carbon black. You noted uh, clean fuel rules and uh, engine. Uh, ship engine and fuel standards. And I, was, I was wondering, are those covered under the other programs? As you know, ARB has quite a few ship engine rules that we've implemented over the last few years. Or is there something new? Covered under, these are all existing Correct. And that's what I was, that, uh, so all, this is the basis of, of what you're working from. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, on slide um, number 12. Okay, and I'm glad Edie and Floyd are here uh, because this is going to be their first conflict in programs. So here you have your basis on uh, 72. Other programs are based on 21 or 24. So uh, am I to assume that if there are emission reductions done under other programs, AB32 programs that we're working on, that we multiply those emission reductions by 3.5, whatever, 3.2, whatever it is, so that you understand that those programs are accomplishing the goals of this program. Because you have different programs that have different GWPs. Um, I'm not sure that I understand the question. Uh, I think what you could do is divide this by essentially three, but whatever the factor is, if, if you're inclined to uh, look at it in 100-year terms. So, for example, the dairy manure one goes from uh, 21 to 7 and change, um, and, and that's, you know, how you would compare it to the inventory. But um, Okay, well, you just essentially said what I said backwards. Um, okay. So I'm, 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 I'm with you. I'm with you. If, if we question. could take this and divide it by 3.2, and that's our goal, based on what we are doing in other programs, that's fine. Um, and that, that really leads to my, my only comment on this. There, there are some sect, industry sectors that are involved in this that have not been so much the focus of past uh, district rules, ARB rules, regulations, and AB 32. Gas and oil industry is. And um, in your slide 15, you allude to the, um, the rulemaking that's going on right now. We call it the methane rule. Uh, for gas and oil industry. And if what you're saying in your strategy that that program addresses uh, what you want to do in terms of uh, addressing methane emissions, uh, we understand, we would understand and, and, and agree with that. What we are concerned about is there's a disconnect between AB 32 and this program. And that would be something that would be really troubling for us. Uh, i.e. a cap within a cap. We're already subject to a cap. And um, from your targets, it appears that you're on the same page. Floyd is here. He's involved in that program. So it appears you're on the same page. But we certainly would like 
some kind of assurance as we as we go forward that we're not dealing with a parallel separate program uh, to AB 32. So that I think that's where we're going to we're going to leave it right now. We will be providing comments. Anybody else? Uh, how about, okay, we got one. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity to speak in front of you. My name is Ben Lubon with Jude Bennett Associates. I represent clean tech clients who capture and reuse waste streams. Um, one question I have, and I have a couple of short comments. Uh, in the pie charts, why is not natural gas from power plants included? There's the, that's a huge revenue driver there. There's a lot of methane emissions from power plants. We can capture that and diversify use those waste streams for other power. Um, you mean fugitive emissions from power plants? Yes. Uh, I know they contain them, but we can contain them better and reuse them, reuse those waste streams to make other things, not necessarily fuel because fuel isn't competitive at the moment, but there are many different types of um, revenue drivers such as pharmaceuticals, nutraceuticals, food, all the way to where we self-contain it and sequester it by creating biochar, a soil amendment that will save water. So the fugitive emissions from a power plant would be in the uh, industrial and miscellaneous sections in the pie chart. Okay. Um, the opportunity to produce electricity from these waste streams is included in the economic analysis. Um, you know, there's there's more value at current credit prices uh, if you can produce transportation fuel. There's more costs too, and, and okay. you know, there's uncertainties associated with that. But uh, we address that in the economic analysis. We're not prescribing one over another, but um, you know, acknowledge that both are options, and there's existing state programs that incentivize both. Okay. Um, I just like on landfills, uh, waste conversion. Um, Anaerobic digestion is an incineration. You know, the emissions that come out of those technologies and even at the dairies, we still need to capture that, which allows other opportunities to actually dairymen could actually become algae farmers and all they could grow so much and reclaim water, uh, create more jobs, so forth, so on. Um, at landfills, um, Yes, we're, I think the last landfill in the state um, is containing its uh, methane from the, re the recovery that's already existed there. But we're developing now a new system of resource recovery there, which involves composting, woody biomass, so forth, so on. So, you know, I work, work with, especially the disadvantaged community, you know, 25% of the financing from AB 32 allocations is supposed to go to the disadvantaged community because certainly emission producers are not by the country club, but they are in the hood. So uh, let's see if I have anything else. Um, questions? Uh, been lobbying to see capture and reuse in the vernacular. I commend the people who have worked on the draft regulations. It's good to see something from my input of the last two years has finally been accepted because that is the money driver. You know, sequestration doesn't happen. We can't sequester whatever into the ground. It's going to go somewhere. You know, it might not, but if we can use those waste streams again, we can make more money, create more jobs. Um, Woody Biomass, don't need to recover that, although at the landfills, since some of the Woody Biomass... Uh, power plants are being closed down. We can use that and create better compost and mix that with the biochar. 
Actually, our state is going to create the international standard for biochar. It's a six-year program already. Let's commend that. And then, lastly, a lot of these programs, they've been at the proven at the bench level, and they've also been proven somewhat at a pilot project. But the Little Hoover Commission in October is going to examine how we can change the financing laws and the drafts. So some of, because right now they're not eligible for some of the AB 32 allocation money. So it would be great to see what, what, where these programs, new technologies, are addressed in October. And uh, Commissioner uh, Pedro Nava is driving this. So we just finished with the Salton Sea this month. And I won't talk about the salt and sea. So thank you so much. And uh, keep on doing the good work you're doing. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bennett Slagers, and I've been a farm worker for over 40 years. I have a brother who has been a farm worker for 45 years, and a sister who has been a farm worker for 50 years. Together we also supply a monthly salary for over 100 families. I will let our industry leaders in the dairy industry address the technical analysis of your proposal, but I would just urge you to adjust your proposal to use an incentive policy uh, rather than a regulation-based policy, and to extend your time to uh, something that the dairy industry can achieve and live with. We have personally been planning a digester for many, many years, seven or eight years, I believe. We are getting very close to construction, but with our experience, this process has taken much time, and it will take any dairy much, much time to, to accomplish. Thank you so much for your time. Any comments here? How about anyone in uh, Modesto or Fresno? Any comments? Yes, we do have some comments. All right, Modesto, you're on. Oh, here we go. Good afternoon, Ryan. Kevin Abernathy with Milk Producers Council and Dairy Cares. Um, Bennett, thank you so much for making those comments. Uh, Ryan, I thought I would just, just um, include a little bit here. This goes back to the meeting that we had last Tuesday up in Sacramento. And I used the term 3, 8, and 13. Uh, you actually are blessed today with having a, a group of gentlemen sitting in the back of the room that have been a part of this process that I think if you'll take a moment after, uh, after this meeting concludes, to visit a little bit on the reality that I had brought forth um, on last Tuesday as to the time that the industry has spent getting to where we're at today. And you've got three prime examples of, of folks that have been working on this with myself for years. And to have the... Um, We have a technical difficulty here. Okay. There we go. Now yeah, we're back. So I, I just wanted to highlight that for you folks. And, 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 this, and as we were talking um, earlier this week on the ag sector portion, I want to I want to overemphasize things that sometimes we take for granted. And the, the amount of, of funding that, that CDFA was, was uh, graciously able to get from the cap and trade to help kickstart this program uh, multiple iterations now has been key to the economic viability of, of producers being able to actually go out and get incentive funding along with 
capital funding to build these projects, uh, Ryan, like the one that you were at a, a few weeks ago there in, in Bakersfield. So in the absence of a voluntary incentive program, this all goes away, folks. That's the cold, stark reality. If you make this program regulatory, the incentives to start this, this endeavor that, that we all are hoping to, to get a chance to do, that falls by the wayside very, very quickly. Um, and as, as all of us know here, in working with the San Joaquin Valley, um, whether it comes to stationary sources, whether it's our icy engines on farm, um, any time that Rule 4702 kicks in and, and it becomes a part of a regulatory process, those incentive funds go away. And one of the reasons that the California dairy industry and the families are so concerned about the talk of a regulatory program is that we, we see the future of those incentives, which will make, make this thing a reality for all of us and help the administration address uh, climate change, will simply go by the wayside. So with that, thanks again for holding these meetings throughout the state. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, just to build on that a little bit, so I, I, what Kevin's referring to is uh, noted in the plan um, that regulatory, once there's regulatory measures in place, uh, the cap and trade offsets in particular uh, would no longer be issued for new projects, um, and that might affect the uh, carbon intensity score under the low carbon fuel standard as well. Um, these projects have a, a 10 year crediting period, so any project built before uh, the timeline of, uh, of a regulation would still get their full 10 year crediting period. So uh, projects built today and over the next several years uh, would still be uh, able to access those credits and would get um, low carbon fuel standard credits at the current number. Um, so just to make that clarifying point. And low carbon fuel standard credits would still be available moving forward, but they might have a lower uh, carbon intensity if there were uh, a regulation in place. But we expect that uh, any project built before, uh, before that regulation uh, were in place would uh, still get their 10 years of, of credit value. All right, Paul. Thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Souza. I'm with Western United Dairymen, and I just wanted to add a little bit to the comments that I made in uh, Sacramento last week. Um, as I mentioned uh, at the last meeting, dairies have reduced enteric emissions by 65% over the last 70 years, uh, and these efforts will continue and are continuing. Uh, so the low-hanging fruit is not in California. The low-hanging fruit on these issues are in other countries where milk production efficiency isn't the same as what we have in LAGS, what we're doing in California. Uh, if ARB is serious about achieving uh, significant reductions in methane from California dairies, uh, funding will have to be equally aggressive as to the goals that we have here today. And uh, available for the full menu of options, as uh, Jenny mentioned, the uh, manure menu, which I actually like. And additionally, other op obstacles will have to be removed so that these projects can actually be implemented. Uh, we heard somebody talking about how long it takes to build a digester project and the, the obstacles that there are uh, in place of getting those things done. Uh, leakage is very real for California dairies. And if regulatory requirements are placed on California dairies, it would only speed that up while reducing the state's ability to get emission reductions from dairies. This will result in a loss of good year-round agricultural jobs that support the communities where dairies are located, uh, and those jobs are much needed, as we heard from our environmental justice folks today. So we urge uh, ARB to work with Western United Dairymen and set reasonable and achievable voluntary dairy methane targets that we can work together towards meeting rather than set ARB and the dairy industry up for uh, failure with targets that just can't be met. Uh, and with that, I thank you for uh, another workshop and the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Uh, anybody else in Modesto? Yes, sir. Hold on. Hi, I'm J.P. Cataviella with Dairy Cares. Uh, I did comment at your last workshop, so I'll avoid uh, repeating myself as much as possible. I did want to respond a little bit to an issue, that, an important issue that I think Mr. France brought up, which is the um, 
issue of uh, cross-media impacts. And, and speci specifically, he mentioned the concerns that he has about burning fuels into the future and also um, the potential that we do things that uh, might increase other types of emissions. I think he mentioned PM, VOC, and, and ammonia. Th those are concerns we share as well. Um, we agree uh, strongly that cross-media impacts can and should be minimized as we proceed to take steps to reduce uh, methane emissions from dairies. One way we can do that is to ensure that methane is captured uh, at least in the short term when it's captured, it, 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 we do as much as possible to use it to replace dirtier fuels such as diesel. Um, in, in the long term, and I, and I think this is something that we should all kind of be thinking about a longer term scale as well as a short term scale, there's other opportunities to use uh, methane uh, as, as, a, as a cleaner burning fuel uh, than many others that are available. Um, for example, uh, fuel cells come to mind. Uh, so we, we really could create a, a stream of, of fuel that can be used to, in the short run, make things better and in the long run to make them even better than that. Um, we do have issues, which we've mentioned before, but I'll mention them here in this context, with the problem with going too fast. We're concerned about the schedule here, the, the very you know, aggressive reductions that really, because they're couched in, in a regulation, become a mandate, um, that those uh, could lead to us making some of the wrong choices, such as too many electricity projects or things that might might do exactly what Mr. France is talking about. Um, and so we think we really have to have a balanced approach and having that balanced approach depends on having enough time to implement wisely these, these solutions. Um, we also, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear about uh, the support for composting because that's, that's a great practice and it's certainly something that we would like to see implemented more widely. But again, this is another practice that needs to be implemented wisely and, um, and scaled uh, uh, carefully because um, we also have the potential for cross-media impacts with composting. Uh, keep in mind that when you start composting manure, you're going to increase uh, tractor traffic on, on dairies. There's going to be a lot more fuel burned in tractors, and that's going to have an impact if it's done on a large scale. Uh, composting itself of manure changes the way the manure breaks down from anaerobic to more of an aerobic process. Uh, the natural result of that is more ammonia and PM emissions. We must consider and evaluate that. That's not to say that we cannot be successful. We just need to be careful and judicious as we move forward, and we're concerned that the time scale on this uh, uh, you know, kind of works against us in that way. Um, and then uh, I won't get into the details of scrape conversions, but they raise many of the same issues that uh, composting would raise. And so, you know, we just were urging uh, a, a deliberate uh, approach. So, um, you know, I, I guess to wrap up, rather than prescribing a timeline that ultimately could to lead to us choosing between economic harm and environmental harm, uh, we would urge AR ARB, and we will continue to do so in our, in our, in our written comments, that we reconsider this uh, unrealistic timeline. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Uh, next. Modest. Did you want to ask him a question? No, no, please go ahead. No, okay. I'm Steve Brink from the California Forestry Association. I'm nervous that we don't have a careful look at the woodways stream in California and how to dispose of it. I think it's a 10 to 20 million bone dry ton per year issue. Um, as Marmel Justice pointed out, they don't want to burn. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to have a regulation that's not going to allow it to be used as cover and landfills anymore. So what are you going to do? You're going to turn it all into biochar? I don't think so. Not 10 to 20 million bone dry tons. And then on top of that, you know, we have an insect and disease epidemic going on as we speak. From last fall's data, we have 20 million bone dry tons of dead trees just in the southern Sierras. That's not in anybody's analysis, I don't think. 
If you leave it out there in the landscape and let it decompose naturally, if you like methane, um, just leave it out there to, de to decompose naturally. Uh, that's, none of that stuff, as far as I know, is in any analysis. Now, you may say, well, the forest carbon plan is going to take care of all that. You look at the draft forest carbon plan, it doesn't do any of this. In fact, it's much like this strategy. There's not hard, actionable items that are going to lead to specific, measurable outcomes. There isn't much of anything like that in the wood waste arena. You said two-thirds of the forests, or two-thirds of the wildfires produce uh, the black carbon, two-thirds of the black carbon. That's going to get worse. The forests are getting denser. Your response to that is, well, the Forest Service is going to do better. Well, that, you know, we've been saying that for years. The Forest Service isn't doing better. When are we going to have a federal government to state government honest discussion about how to deal with over 50% of the productive forest land in California being under federal control that's just getting denser and denser and denser and currently burning at the rate of 320,000 acres a year in wildfires and getting worse. Now, I don't see any of that uh, either in this strategy or in any other strategy. In fact, pretty much just ignored and you go off into the the non-forest components, which, I mean, that's good, but the forest components is a big problem. And it's not just the forests, it's the ag waste too. You know, the almond orchard that was mentioned. What about the almond orchard removals and prunings and all the crop agricultural wood waste that's created every year? Now, I just don't see it. And I was curious for The Economist if you've seen the April 16 LAO publication about cost per ton of emission reductions for GHGs that just came out. I was struck by the enormous range in those numbers. Uh, for $4, you can get a ton of emission reduction for forest health and fuels reduction. For $8 in the dairy digester arena. Residential solar, $209 per ton of emission reduction. I mean, these are dramatic numbers. And I was curious, did you have those numbers before they published them for this in the EA, or, or is it going to be a, uh, taken up at a later date, or how are you going to address that kind of information? No, Thank that. You. I'll answer that. Um, no, we were not. Um, we did not receive uh, those numbers ahead of time. So um, we're going to work to make sure that we are consistent with the numbers that are presented across the board. Um, but that'll be in uh, the next version and in other plans as well. Uh, thank you. Anybody else in Modesto? No further comments from Modesto. All right. How about Fresno? Anybody in Fresno? All right, we did receive one uh, comment uh, from online uh, from Luis Almedo from uh, the Environmental Justice Advisory Committee. Uh, he was saying he, he um, requests that uh, in, program, in modeling program design uh, for pollution reduction and incentivized programs, um, please add uh, reference, if I think I'm understanding this correct, please add reference uh, to the fact that Imperial County is climate zone two and the only climate zone two in the entire state due to extreme desert heat. Um, and it should not be categorized in region five with Southern California and other counties that have cooler temperatures. Um, and I think that uh, uh, has an impact on some of our uh, stuff maybe related to energy efficiency and conservation. So we'll, we'll consider that. Um, thank you. Anything else from the internet? Uh, all right, any last calls for Bakersfield? Anybody in the room? No? Uh, well, feel free to come back and comment this evening. Uh, we'll be here at 6. <laughs> Thank you again uh, to our hosts and for all of those uh, of you who participated. Uh, go Warriors. Thank you. Go Bears.